Welcome to the Intel with Greg Cosell. I'm Jeff Mosher alongside Adam Kaplan. And with us is that guy that we named the show after. He's Greg Cosell, NFL film senior producer, of course, host of ESPN's NFL matchup show. And you get to see him almost every game day during the season on Inside the Birds pregame live. That's a lot of hats that you wear, Mr. Cosell. Well, you know what I most appreciate, Jeff, that you actually call me by my name, because very often on Twitter, I get called by many other things besides my name. So really? I really appreciate it. <laughs> Words that we shouldn't use in, in a family friendly program. <laughs> so, so, Greg, real quick, because you brought that up. Is it because the, the fans, because if you're giving an opinion on team's player and they, they don't agree with it, so they're obviously giving you some feedback. Yes, yes. I get I get a lot of feedback, as it were, Adam. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff well we're looking for your feedback <laughs> in this show we're looking for your feedback on, on two things it's going to be a two-part show part one we're going to recap free agency obviously the eagles lost more than they gained but we're going to go through some guys that they did gain and get your tape breakdown on those guys and then uh we will also move forward and talk start nfl draft preview now we did tease cornerbacks but we all decided as a committee that you are way down the road on on edge rushers, so we'd rather go with yeah. edge rushers. I'm, I'm with... working my way through corners now, you know, and but because corners, and, and I, I don't know if people are aware of this, you have to sit and watch full games and a lot of games right. because you can go through a corner and, you know, the ball might not be thrown at all, and so you have to see how he plays in a lot of different games. Um, like Christian Gonzalez is a great example of that. And he of the corners I've watched, I love that kid, but we'll get to that in another show. But you know, the ball, the ball's never thrown to, to, to him. I mean, he could, maybe it's because he's so good, but the ball's never thrown. So right. you got to sit and you got to watch a lot of games and you got to watch full games and you have to watch every play. Right. So we want your best evaluation of this cornerback group. So we're going to give you some time on that and we'll get into edge rushers in this part of the Intel with Greg Cosell. So let's start off recapping free agency. Uh, the Eagles obviously brought in a couple of names. One's really interesting. I don't even know if you've been able to watch tape on one. We'll talk because he just signed and he has he was out of football for three years during his career. But obviously the bigger names are Rashad Penny, the running yeah. back that they brought in. And um, uh, well, let's start with Rashad Penny before we get to anybody else. Uh, you know, we know he's a very productive player when healthy, but he has been healthy very much. What, what does the tape show on yeah. Rashad Penny when he is healthy, Greg? Yeah, and that's the big question, Jeff. You've hit it right on the head. Can he play 17 games or at least 14 or 15? Um, he is a really explosive back. If you go back uh, two years, those last five or six games of the year with Seattle, I believe he led the, the NFL in rushing those last five or six weeks with a lot of big explosive runs for a team with Seattle that was a run first team. And let's keep in mind that the Eagles are a schemed run game more than a we need a great back run game because of Jalen Hurts, obviously. Jalen Hurts dictates how defenses have to play with their fronts and even with their coverages, what they have to do with safeties because they always have to bring a safety down to be the alley player because of Hurts. So it's it gives you defined ways to run the football so it's highly schemed. And Penny's a more explosive back than Sanders. Um, I think... If all, if if you're trying to be fair based on tape, he's probably a better back for what the Eagles do because I think he gives you more explosive home run hitting ability, and he's big. He's about 220 pounds, so he's not a scat back, um, but he can take it to the house. So. You, you know, backs these days in the NFL sign a lot of short term deals because there's a sense that you're certainly not going to sign backs who are, you know, 26, 27, 28 to longer term deals because we see what happens with backs over time. You know, just look at someone like Zeke Elliott, who I guess is still out there. Um, yep. But, you know, I think the penny signing is a really, really good signing. I, I saw him, Greg, in tra at Seahawks training camp a couple of times. I know he's not like 6'2, but he's. There was one point, in fact, I, I remember his rookie season. He came in there about 235. You go, how could this guy move that big so well? Yep. So is he a one-cut guy? Like, his style, what is his style? Yeah, like? I'd say he's more like that. You know, he's not – I wouldn't say the way people think of shifty and elusive. I wouldn't say he's that kind of back. He's more of a daughter and a slasher. Um, mm. 
but he's one cut downhill and he he gets to speed quickly. And as I said, because the Eagles run game is so highly schemed that and it creates opportunities. You know, I think he's really his style of running will fit really well with the Eagles. And and as Jeff pointed out, and he's 100 percent right, the key is durability. Can he play? Because the Eagles, we know that their run game is not such that, OK, Penny's going to get 20 carries every week. You know, he may get that every once in a while. We saw games where I remember Miles had 27 carries in one game this year, which was his really good game. As I recall, I can't remember who that was against, but he had 27, I believe, for 134 in a game um, and I, maybe another game or two over 20. But it wasn't as if they went into every game saying, hey, we got to give Miles Sanders 20 plus carries or we're not, we can't run our offense. You know, that's not the way the Eagles think about their run game. Let well, me ask you. Thing, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just going to follow up. Trey Sermon, Greg. We haven't. Yeah. Seen, we only saw two carries. What, what What's your thought process on Trey Sermon evaluating his tape from the Niners in college? You know, I really liked him coming out of college. You know, he started at Oklahoma, then he went to Ohio State. I thought his last year at Ohio State, he was very good, particularly the last part of the season. Um, in fact, when the Niners drafted him, I thought, hey, that's a pretty good pick. Um, you may know more about exactly what happened out there. You know, there's a lot of reports, um, but I think just in terms of traits, I thought he was a really good prospect. Um, obviously, the Eagles, he wasn't even active. He was a healthy scratch pretty much every week, except for what, Jeff, one game, two games? Was that it? Um, yes. Just, no, one game. It was the Jacksonville game that I believe was the only game he had pl uh, carries. Yeah, and other than that, he was pretty much a healthy scratch. So, again, I don't know where he stands. Obviously, they don't think. He's the guy they wanted to replace Miles Sanders, so they would not have signed Rashad Penny to a one-year deal. But I think he's a pretty good runner. You know, I think, it, you know, in an ideal world, could he be a guy that's similar to what Jordan Howard did for this team? Mm. Yes, but something's going on there that we don't know about. Right. Hmm. We do know that the coaches really liked him. We got good intel on that. He just didn't factor in right. because they had a pretty productive running game. But the coaches were very impressed with how he's how he practiced this year. Uh, and maintained himself despite not getting a lot of carries. But, you know, so. and which makes it interesting, Jeff, because they just re-signed Boston Scott. They're not going to dress for – they're not going to dress Scott, Penny, Gainwell, and and Sermon. So it's going to be an interesting battle through OTAs and, and training camp. We know Penny's going to be there. We know Gainwell's going to be there. Obviously, they signed Scott, but, you know, the, I think the Scott-Sermon battle will be interesting. Yeah, great point. And I don't know if it jumps out to you as much as it does to me, but anytime we talk about Trey and his college career, that Big Ten championship against Northwestern, he took over yes. that game in a way that very rarely happens anymore for running backs. That was no correct. His his uh yeah, that was an amazing game. So let's let's talk about somebody that we actually almost foreshadowed in a past intel with Greg Cosell because we had a lengthy discussion about Greedy Williams and the idea yeah. that he would be uh, a pretty ideal fit for the Eagles. And then lo and behold, they go and sign him to a one-year deal. Um, we gave some intel just from our sources on the podcast based on what the league viewed him as, a very athletic corner, but not guy who has great play strength, um, not a guy who's a, a great tackler, which, you know, for some teams, they don't really value that in corner. Others do. But from your advantage, from a tape sta standpoint, what do you, what's left with it? What does this guy have? What can he be? Well, I, I think for people who, you know, follow college football, he went to LSU as the next corner. Okay. The LSU puts out corners every single year. And he went to LSU, as I recall, had a really good first season there. And people started to talk about him as he's the next great guy because he's long, he's athletic, he's a traits player. He never had very good technique. He was never a technician. Fundamentally, he was never really sound. But, you know, in college, you could compensate for that because it's college football. Um, then he spent a lot of time being injured in the NFL, and it hasn't quite worked out for him. But I guarantee, you know, when teams, as, as, as you guys know, when teams sign a player like that, they normally go back to their evaluation of him. Somebody in the building liked him. And they should like him. I mean, the guy's long. As I said, he's athletic. Um, you know, Slay is older. Bradbury's older. I know they just signed Bradbury to a three-year deal. I know they reworked Slay. But they're older corners. You don't know exactly what's going to happen. Okay, we, we can see. We see that in the league all the time. You just don't know. So maybe he can be rehabilitated. Maybe he can stay healthy. I know he had a shoulder injury that, from what I gather, is kind of lingering. But, again, I don't know. Adam, you may know more about that. 
Um, but he certainly fits the profile. He, everybody wants corners that are tall and long. You know, they prefer tall and long to short and stubby at the corner position, you know? <laughs> so, you know, he he has traits. He's always had traits. So maybe different coaching staff, different way of, you know, getting across to him, maybe with veterans like Bradbury. And, and from what I understand, you know, uh, from people who know Bradbury, you know, in the business, and I don't know if you've spent time with him, you guys, but he's supposed to be incredibly intelligent, one of those leader types, you know, slays a veteran. Maybe they feel they can bring this guy along and and raise his level to what the traits suggest. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. One yeah. more, uh, Greg, one more. This guy, Bucks thought he was going to be a stud. He went up not playing for three, he, like he was with teams, but he went up taking a snap for three seasons. That's Justin Evans now. Yeah. What can you tell us about? Justin Evans came out of Texas A&M in 2017 as kind of an athletic marvel. And, mm. you know, there were a lot of people, including myself, to some degree, who thought he could come into the league and be a really, really good player. Traits-based, another traits-based player. Um, mm. When he was in New Orleans, he was used very often when guys were injured as their dime safety, played meaningful snaps. Um, you know, I remember always thinking when I watched him at Texas A&M that he was really athletic, wasn't a very good tackler. That was an issue. I don't know what he is now because, you know, he he's not been used in that way. But he was athletic, looked the part. You know, he's close to six feet, runs, has always run well. Um, again, another guy, they don't have safeties. So he's coming in and he's going to have to compete, I'm sure. But I, Someone in I'm I'm in the building I'm sure thinks that hey we can get the best out of this guy and he can be a starting safety because the traits suggest he could be. Hmm. It's interesting that all three guys that we've just talked about have significant injury history, significant yeah. upside. They're low risk. Well, that's high upside type of. It's signings. all one year deals, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, I mean yep. that's you know I know the NFLPA isn't real happy about all these one year deals, but a lot of guys have signed one year deals, and you know. I don't know if that's the new way of the world with certain guys or not, but you know, that's been the case around the league. Mm, when you definitely. get to the second week, that's what you get. That, yeah. That's yeah. Not, you know, the now, first week is, is high and then. Right. And in that category is another one. The Eagles are reportedly today, probably going to sign Nicholas Morrow, the linebacker who uh, oh. was last with the bears. And then in 2021, I believe he was out for the season uh wait is he the same more then the eagles have a he linebacker was, named moro from the university of delaware a few years ago it's not him hurt. it's not no, him. that's right it's a different moro but yeah, yeah nicholas well, moro he was with the raiders as well mm -hmm. um he he was always a sub package linebacker because he's very athletic um you know and again now it gets down to how much sub you play um that's what his game is he started a lot of games in the nfl he's played a lot of snaps so if they sign him he's a guy you could probably plug right in and play, you know, mm. in your sub for sure. And again, they need linebackers. So I don't know. We have to wait and see how all that plays out. You know, obviously they're expecting Nicobe Dean to be a starter. You, you right. Know, these things you don't know until it happens. Um, how would you compare but, Moro to Kaiser White then, as far as adequately being a, and, and Kaiser White sometimes started, sometimes didn't. So I imagine right. that would be the case here. Um, I would say he's probably a little more athletic than White. Um, hmm. Probably uh probably not as as much of a run defender he's lighter um but he can move he's he's always been an athletic player who's been a sub defense player and at times has played well i mean he's like i said he's played a lot of snaps in this league so yeah go ahead Adam. i remember seeing with the raiders he he actually is really small he's like six feet yeah maybe. he is small 228, 230, but he's he, he's had actually a lot. In fact, he led the Bears last year, or at least close to leading them in tackles. I think. Yeah. Uh, look, he's a, he's a one, he's another one of these stopgap one year guys. Who's yeah. Trend year continues. Guy. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. This revolving door with these one year linebackers, it's fascinating. Though they they nailed the Kaiser White. That was that was a good signing. Yeah. You now with Arizona, yeah. but hey, here here's another guy. All right, Greg, uh, around the league real quick, we'll finish up on some other free agents. The Dallas Cowboys, uh, they they make a trade really to get Stephon Gilmore and a trade to get Brandon Cook. So these aren't really free agent signings, but it's movement, player right. movement there. Um, what kind of impact should those two players have on, on the Cowboys? Well, the Cowboys have been looking for the last couple of years for someone to play opposite Trayvon Diggs. And obviously they didn't feel that they had 
they had someone. You know, it was kind of a revolving door last year. I think they thought that the Joseph kid who they drafted out of Kentucky, I believe, two years ago, mm-hmm. um, you know, he he started at LSU. He's a high level traits player, but he's always had some issues from what I'm told. So, you know, I guess he hasn't worked out. So they need someone to play opposite digs. You know, Gilmore, I don't think is quite the same man to man defender he was in his prime, but he's certainly a quality player. And, uh, you know, they know they can line up with Stefan Gilmore and be very, very comfortable. Um, as far as Cooks, you know, it's funny. Last season, it was um, probably mid-season or so. I made the point talking to someone on a show that, you know, the Cowboys receiving core was really not that good. And I immediately got just ripped on Twitter. Just, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about, blah, blah, blah. Well, like a day or two later, they signed T.Y. Hilton. So mm-hmm. they basically told us that their receiving core wasn't that good. <laughs> and now they went out, of course, and traded for Brandon Cooks, who, you know, has obviously been with many teams, but he's obviously a pretty skilled receiver. Um, there must be some other things going on because he's with so many teams, but he puts up numbers wherever he is. So, again, they're telling you that they need to upgrade their receiving core. Um you know, obviously they've got Lamb, um, who spends uh, the majority of his time in the slot. So we'll see now how all, all this maps out and works out. Um, they ended up playing a lot of Noah Brown last year, who's now uh, no longer there. I think he signed with Houston. Is that correct, Adam? Yes. They've, they, Houston's up to it again with these bunch of low-level or mid-level free agents. Yeah. From the deal short term. But, I mean, Brown was playing a lot of snaps for them last mm-hmm. year just because he had to. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, so the Cowboys obviously felt both midseason last year and now offseason this year that they needed to upgrade their receiver position because unfortunately, and it's a shame, Michael Gallup has just not come back to be the receiver he was before the major knee injury. And he was a really good boundary X receiver, but it just hasn't quite, you know, he hasn't quite been able to get back to that. One more guy before we get started on, on edge rushers. I want to stay in the division. Bobby Okereke with the Giants. I know the Giants yep. fans are excited. How does he how does he fit in with this this defense? Oh yeah. He's he's a he's a really good player. Really, you know, he's an athletic linebacker, pretty much played every snap, even when Leonard is in there. They were the nickel linebackers. He played, like I said, pretty much every snap. Athletic. Um, yeah, he's he's a really good so he'll he'll fit what, what Wink Martindale wants to do because he can do multiple things. And we know that Wink Martindale wants players who can do multiple things. So I thought when I saw that signing. I actually reached out to a guy we all know very well, Pat Leonard, who covers the yeah. Giants. And I said, hey, Pat, man, that's a really good signing. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think it is. I think that he'll be a really meaningful player for that Giants defense. And by the way, they got Darren Waller to upgrade up that yeah. offense. And I don't yeah. know. You know, I know he was hurt a lot last year, Greg. But when he did get on the field, did he look like he could still – was he still the same Darren Waller? Um, because sometimes injuries yeah. take, take away I mean, I think he's still – if he's healthy, he's going to be that guy. You know, the key with Waller, just like we talk about with Rashad Penny, is you got to stay on the field. But if he's healthy, he's he's a difficult matchup and an important player for the Giants. All right. You know what? We keep lying. We have to throw one more guy, Greg, because we forgot one very important signing that the Eagles made <laughs> that uh, we have to go through. And b- before I ask you about him, Greg, I, I, you know, Adam and I try to avoid the this is good. This is bad. You know, we're we're just the facts like you are. Um, so I know the Eagles needed a backup quarterback, so I'm not making a judgment on what they did. They needed uh, one. And by the way, <laughs> it's, I thought it was a great signing. Because- okay, see, that's see on my end, just from watching him, and you watch the tape well, a lot more than I do, I just thought last year there were times he was – Marcus Mariota couldn't hit the broad yeah, side. Yeah, but, but you have to think of it this way. He can run the Eagles' offense. You know, he is a similar style player, sure. not as good a thrower as Hurts is right now. Um, and, and you're right, he's – you're right, Jeff. I mean, he'll miss throws without question. Okay. But the point is, if you have to play your backup, okay, you you would like to be in a situation where you don't have to make dramatic changes in the way you play, because that's hard to do in the middle of a season. Sure. You know, it's hard to to every week run pages one through 20 of your playbook, and then all of a sudden your starter gets hurt, and now you've got to go through page 80 to 100 in your playbook, because everybody else has to do that. It's not just your quarterback. So 
you know, Mariota can run the same offense that Hurts can run and, in fact, create some of the same issues in the run game because he's a factor in the run game. He's not as good a thrower. He certainly doesn't have the deep arm. You know, he's never had the big arm. His deep balls always lose a little bit of energy on the back end, so maybe you're not going to see the vertical pass game. But for the most part, he can run the basic concepts that the Eagles run. So I thought that was actually a really good signing you know, and, and don't forget, the hope is he doesn't have to take a meaningful snap. That's right. always the hope. But yes. he can do that. And he's played enough snaps in this league that you're not concerned about him with any mental issues, you know, any concern that he just doesn't have enough experience. You know, he can you can put him out there if you have to. I, I certainly took that into account. I thought he would be better for for doing athletic things offensively like Jalen does. Yep. But I also looked at the bigger picture when Gardner Minshew had to step in. They are a throwing team. They have a lot of throwing weapons. And he, you know, won the game against the Jets a few years ago, played well against the Cowboys. I know he had two interceptions, but he was able to throw for over 300 yards. I don't know that I feel confident that Marcus could go in there and give you 40% conversion on third downs in a big division game the way he throws the ball. Uh, and, or at least and, and from what gonna, I saw from him last year. Yeah, yeah. and I'm not going to, uh, you know, agree or disagree because we don't know the answer to that. Right, totally um, different scheme in offense. But I, you know, but I think what I said does have merit, the fact that they don't have to make significant adjustments in their sure. pass, in their in their offense. Absolutely. And, and he does present some of the same same stress and challenges for defenses the way the Eagles in, structure their offense. Sure. Absolutely. All right, we'll see. And you're like you say, hopefully the Eagles don't have to use them, but we know the history of the league. Right. Quarterbacks get hurt. It's more than likely he'll have to get in there at some point, and then we'll get a better idea of how he is in the Eagle scheme. Let us transition to our draft preview. We're going to talk about edge rushers. We're talking about, you know, DNs, 4-3 DNs, or 3-4 outside linebackers, the guys who attack the edges. There's a, a bunch of really good ones in this year's draft. Uh, we'll get started with you on sort of an obvious one who probably won't be available to the Eagles at 10, definitely not at 30. Uh, unless there's some kind of unforeseen slide, and that's Alabama's Will Anderson, who has sort of been the the darling uh, top pick, if not a quarterback, for almost two years now. They've been talking about him. Um, what do you see in Will Anderson from Alabama? You know, I think Anderson is a good prospect. I don't think he's a great prospect. Um, you know, I think that when you watch Alabama's tape, you know, they do a lot of slanting. They do a lot of stunting, and that really helps him a lot. Um you know, I think that so we can get through a number of guys, you know, I think when I watch Anderson, I think he's a little tight hipped. He's a little straight line linear in his overall movement. So he's an explosive physical power player, much more than an athletic player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you don't see him beat tackles a whole lot off the edge to the to the high side. I mean, obviously, you can find plays where he does do that. No question. The question is, can he do that at the NFL level? Um, I think that he's at his best when he can work back inside with a counter um, to the low side. Um, you know, I, I, I kept watching, you know, obviously I watched a ton of Alabama and I watched him last summer too from 2021 when his numbers were better, but the traits are the traits. Um, you know, I think he's much more of a relentless edge pass rusher than a flexible edge pass rusher. He doesn't really have what we like to call motorcycle lean. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, I see him as similar to Kayvon Thibodeau, another guy that struggled to flatten his rush path when he went on the high side. So I think Anderson is a good prospect. I, to, to me, I don't know if he's a great prospect. Greg, a guy that I think he fits in really well at the next level is a 34 edge rusher. A guy, guy who's not the tallest guy, but got super long arms and great athleticism is Nolan Smith from Georgia. What's the tape show you on Nolan Smith? Yeah, Nolan Smith is another guy that, it, you know, I, I first of all, <laughs> Nolan Smith is really light. Um, so the question is, is he an edge pass rusher in the NFL? Um, he was not a great pass rusher at Georgia. Um, he looks great on the field. Um, he's incredibly athletic. Um, I think that most people see him as an edge pass rusher. Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, it's funny. I watched him last summer when he played, you know, all season. And I watched pretty much all his games from this year before he got hurt against Florida. And I kept watching his tape thinking to myself, I wonder if he'd be better off as a linebacker in the mold of Fred Warner. 
He's mm. basically built mm. like Fred Warner. Um, you know, he's 6'2", 238. He's obviously really athletic. I, I just don't know if he's a great pass rusher. And at 238 pounds, you know, I, I'm, I'm uncertain. He may be, and I could well be wrong, but that's what I kept thinking when I watched him. I, you know, I kept thinking to myself, God, this guy could be a really, really good stacked linebacker. And I know some former coaches believe the same thing. I know Mike Zimmer believes that, by the way. So, you know, that's, like I said, I could well be wrong. And if I am, you know, hey, then I'm wrong. But that's, I, I don't see a lot of great pass rush traits other than the fact that he's a highly athletic, explosive mover. 439 in the 40 is ridiculous at linebacker. It just, that is yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Now again, he's because he, he's smaller. You think, okay, thirty-four outside linebacker, but as Greg said to move forward here with these athletic traits, do you think maybe if he puts on a little bit of a strength, maybe he can play? Maybe, like, like I said, Adam, I could well be wrong. You know, time will tell. Um, you know, he's got a waist that I would love to have. You know, the guy's got no waist, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, he's super athletic. There's no getting around that. There's no getting around the fact that this guy is a high, high level athlete. I just don't know how good a pass rusher he is. And then you get into, can he be taught to be a good pass rusher? And, and, you know, we've all talked to coaches through the years. Some coaches speak about pass rushing as, Hey, I can teach a guy. Other coaches talk about it as if, Hey, guys have an instinct for rushing the quarterback. And that's just the way it is. So, you know, I guess it depends on who drafts them and how they see him. All right, Craig, I want, the next guy I can't wait to ask you about, because um, since I got back from the combine, I've been asking several personnel folks in the NFL, uh, just a simple question. Give me the one guy whose tape you just loved. Like, it just you just it, I didn't, it doesn't have to be at any position and it doesn't even have to be your best overall guy. Just give me someone whose tape you loved watching. Right. So I, I'm fascinated to ask you who watches so much tape, because by far the number one guy I got in those responses was Tyree Wilson from Texas Tech. There must be something really fun about the guy on tape for the people who I talked to. What was well, your observations from him? Because this guy freaking looks the part. I mean, he's six five and a half. He's 271. His arm length is almost 36 inches. His wingspan is like Giannis in the NBA. So, hmm. you know, people look at this guy and they are really excited about him. I mean, if you go back in, in recent years and even a little further back, He's very, very, very similar measurables to Trayvon Walker from last year, to Joe Tryon when he came out of UW, to Marcus Davenport, to Jason Pierre-Paul, to Carlos Dunlap. They, they, they all look very, very much the same. So you're dealing with a guy that really looks the part, size, length, athleticism, alignment, versatility. I mean, this guy's got imposing size and length. Um and like I said, he just really, really looks the part. Um, and there's a lot of flashes in his tape, guys, that lead you to believe he could become a complete edge rusher in the NFL. Speed to power, quickness to clear the arc. He can counter inside. Some of this is a work in progress, but you see it on tape. Um, one of the things, though, that really stood out, and I'm going to try to find out, talk to some people. And and I know you guys talk to people as well. So I'd be curious if, if you would throw this out when you talk to people. He was late off the snap on almost every play, you mm -hmm. know, just a beat late off the snap. Um, can that be fixed? Because if you're late off the snap in the NFL, you know, no matter how good you are with your traits as a pass rusher, that's a problem. So but the traits are there and, and he really looks the part. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, another guy that uh, we've heard great things about is Lucas Van Ness from Iowa. What's the tape show you? And also, how does he project to the next level? Yeah, Lucas Van Ness is a power player. Um, and, you know, I I'm really curious with him how teams see him because I think he's a little bit of a difficult projection. Um, mm. You know, he's he's got great functional strength. I mean, he can... First of all, if when you watch his tape at Iowa, he played all over. He was not an edge player just all the time. He played three technique. He played one technique. He played inside. You know, he's a strong player. Um, that's his game. He's not necessarily a bender. 
Um, he's got a great speed to power pass rush when he does line up off the edge. He's explosive with velocity and power. He moves people. I mean, he ate up Paris Johnson, the left tackle for Ohio State, who, you know, most people have mocked as a top 12 pick. And he just ate him up with power. He just drove him into the pocket. Um, he's not, despite testing numbers, he does not play like a great athlete. He's a little stiff and tight hipped. Um, he's not a fluid guy, which leads some to believe that he could be an inside player more than an edge player. Hmm. You know, one player that came to my mind when I watched Lucas Van Ness, believe it or not, was Zach Allen. Um, and Zach Allen, I believe he signed with Denver, did he not? Yeah, he so did. I was going to mention him because the measurables are almost exact. Yeah. And again, little... without even knowing the measurables, yeah. Adam, that's the guy I thought of yeah. when I watched his tape because I watched Lucas Van Ness a number of weeks ago. So, you know, I think it was before Zach Allen signed with Denver. Uh, obviously, it was before because free agency hadn't started. Um, and I didn't even think of the measurables, but that's a player I thought of. Um, so Van Ness is going to be interesting. He's going to be evaluation and team and scheme specific. You know, he can play all over. I don't know if you just line him up at, on the edge and say, that's the guy. But, you know, you can move him around in some ways the way the Chiefs used George Karloftis. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Was he not a starter at Iowa, Greg? He didn't technically start, no. But, you know. It's interesting. Um, yeah. Um, you know, he was a D tackle primarily in 2021. And this year in 2022, he did play meaningful snaps on the edge um you know he was a hockey player growing up he didn't start playing football until the eighth grade he grew up a hockey player huh. interesting oh stuff hmm. all right let's um also talk about miles murphy from clemson greg i know it's a guy that that is getting a lot of accolades some people feel is a first round talent yeah another guy that looks the part man this guy's six five two sixty eight long arms um I thought he was much better in 2022 than he was in 2021. I thought in 2022, he showed more bend and flexibility off the edge, some motorcycle lean clearing the arc. Um, yeah, the, he's another guy that if you just look at the numbers, you're not going to go, wow, this guy is just a sack machine. But but he's got the traits. I mean, he's got a prototypical build and frame for a 4-3 D end. Um, he's long and lean. He looks muscular. He's naturally athletic. He does show some explosion off the ball. He can attack the high side, you know, and 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 you know, win off the edge. Um, he can show he showed inside counters, um, strong hands. There were snaps he jarred, um, uh, uh, you know, offensive tackles with with power in his hand strikes. I mean, he's he's a really interesting prospect because people will say that oh, you know, the numbers aren't there, the stats aren't there, the sacks aren't there, and they're not. Um, uh, and I think he's got some work to do, but he's another guy that really, really looks the part. Is he more of a 4-3 at the end in your mind? Yes. Okay. I mean, look, so many teams play 5-2 fronts now. So can he theoretically in a 5-2 front line up, you know, in the Josh Sweat position? He probably mm -hmm. can. But, you know, just if you're being more conventional and traditional – He's a four three D N, but teams so many teams now line up in these five man fronts that I don't think a team that does a lot of that is going to say we can't draft him. But you know, that's that's what he would be if you're thinking conventionally. Let's go to the younger brother of Aziz Ojalari. That's BJ Ojalari to LSU, who looks the part, Greg. He's long. Where's he fit at the next level? Yeah, he's another guy very similar in that regard. Um, you know, he's he's two forty eight. Really long arms, just like his brother. Um, he he played almost exclusively on the edge, Adam. Um, and uh, he rarely left the field, by the way, which I thought was really, really impressive for, for you know, in, in today's college football. The guy was on the field for almost every single snap, and I watched a lot of games. Um, so he's going to be a, either a <clears> – <throat> he's going to be probably a, a, an outside linebacker type, you know, if you're in your base defense, and then he's an edge rusher. And he can also be a joker, move around, stand up on the inside, you know, in, in long yardage situations. Um, I thought his game in 2022 was really kind of complete. I mean, he mm -hmm. played the run really well. He, he played hard. He was physical. He was competitive. He used his hands well. He had a nonstop motor. Um, we know he can rush the quarterback. He's got quickness and burst and explosiveness to rush off the edge. 
Um, he's a sudden mover. I mean, he really has those sudden traits that you really like. Um, outstanding length. He can bend the edge. Now, he's a classic case of a guy that has motorcycle lean. Um, he can use his arms effectively in the speed to power game. Um, I really liked him. I think um, I think he's a premium prospect as you project him and transition him to the next level. Greg, um, not often that we talk about a prospect from Army. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a guy we're not going to talk about because I haven't seen him. Okay, sorry about that. He was on the list. <laughs> I, I threw him in there just thinking he might have. But I did want to ask you about the Iowa State kid also. Um, oh, Will, Will McDonald. McDonald Jr., yeah. 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 Um, Will McDonald, I watched last summer with his 2021 tape, and I really, really liked him. Really liked him. Now, you know, some of these players, Will McDonald's one of them, guys, they line up in a lot of these three-man fronts, okay? And because that's what these teams play, Iowa State. So what happens is, is these guys end up playing inside of offensive tackles. They get double teamed an awful lot. So their sack numbers are not really big. And people might look at that and not know how they're asked to play within the context of their college defense. So they play a ton of three-man fronts. So this year, her sack numbers were less than they were in each of the previous two years. But this guy is... He's another guy with natural quickness. Um, I, I remember watching him at the combine, man, and and the drills that showed that that looseness and and that you know kind of flexibility. He was great. Um, he has burst, bend, flexibility, and closing speed off the edge. He's a loose, sudden athlete. He's got good length. Um, I really like Will McDonald. I think in the NFL, he's not going to line up inside of offensive tackles. He's going to be an edge player. Um, and I think he's a really, really good prospect. There's a guy that's a little bit older. That's Byron Young. Ah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about him. He's 25. Byron Young, I knew nothing about before I started watching the tape. Okay. Um, because there's two Byron Youngs, believe it or not. There's yes. a tackle from, from uh, Alabama, who's actually a really good prospect, too. But I knew nothing about the Tennessee Byron Young before I started watching his tape. And... I really like him. I really like him. Um, I think that, um, you know, he's a guy that will play in five, two fr fr fronts, five man fronts. Um, he's sudden, he's twitchy. He's got great burst off the ball as an edge pass rusher. He's got the body flexibility and that lean to clear the arc and flatten his, his rush path to the quarterback. Um, you know, watching him, to be honest with you, I saw a lot of Hassan Reddick. I mean, mm. I think Young needs a little more in the way of learning how to counter and learning how to do some things from a technique standpoint. But, you know, you're dealing with a guy that's 6'2 and a quarter, 248, who ran a 4'4'3. Okay, mm. his arm length is fine. Um, I, yeah, I saw a lot of Hassan Riddick in his game. Hmm. That's, a, that's a high compliment for him. That's yeah, an that's... interesting one. Definitely some explosion there. All right, last one for me, Greg, uh, is going to be, and I don't want to confuse him with Philly's first baseman, Derek Hall, but it's Auburn's, <laughs> Auburn's Derek Hall, not Derek Hall. Not so Derek, uh, tell us about Derek tell Hall. Us about yeah. Derek Hall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a, he's, um, a long-arm pass rusher, knows how to use his length to attack and defeat um, offensive tackles. He's a speed-to-power guy. He's not a bender. He's not a flexible guy. He's kind of straight line linear. He's not, he's not a loose hipped twitchy guy. He's got some tightness in his core, um, but he does show some explosiveness off the ball. Um, got a great one arm stab. That's his deal. That's his signature move. That one arm stab as an edge rusher, causing offensive tackles to get out of phase, lose their technique. It sets up an, a, a really nice rip rip move. Um you know, he does know how to play off contact, which you have to be able to do to rush the quarterback. But he's a power player. He's a power pass rusher um, with the with initial contact strength to transition to power and drive back offensive tackles. He's not a bender. Um, so, you know, but like I said, he's got really long arms, which helps him with the one arm stab and the ability to use his arms effectively because it's 34 and a half inch arms, which is really good arm length for a pass rusher. Um, so. You know, that's what he is. Uh, so, again, he's another guy that fits that that edge element that can play on the edge in five-man fronts. He was used as a joker at uh, at Auburn where they moved him around a little bit. But for the most part, he's an edge player. Well, this is a pretty good group so far of, of either edges yeah. or um, – you, know, you know, it's funny. I think 
you, as you know, Adam, you talk to people and some people say it's a good group and some people say it's not because, you know, it all depends on how people see guys right. and, and how they see them within the context of their team. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, you know, Will Anderson, I, I have some questions about him, which, by the way, I talked to a lot of people at the Combine who had questions about Will Anderson. So my thoughts about him, which came solely from tape study, were echoed by a lot of people I spoke to. So, again, we're not saying, and I'm not saying he could come in the league and be great, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily be surprised by that. But I think there are legitimate questions about him as you try to transition him to the league. And there's always questions about players because no one comes into the NFL as a finished product. True. true. Yeah, I, I would say, if anything, maybe this is a deep and diverse group more than yes. a blue chip elite group but uh that's a great way to say it Jeff. that's a great point yeah yeah I, i'm really fascinated by the van ness kid just to say, like you are just kind of where he projects what position he might play where he's best at mm -hmm. so um some good and names the guy there. that really fascinates me as i said is nolan smith yeah. because maybe he is a great edge pass rusher and that's right. what he'll be right but right. i'm just so because i know that's like i said i know coaches who see him the, the way i saw him that just thought hey this guy could be a great stack backer you know but i guess we'll find out sounds good and we will find out more from greg cosell next week when we move on to a different position to preview for the nfl draft uh do you want to tease right now what position we can do like corners next week for sure because i'm more, yeah. working through corners oh. now oh. awesome well we look forward to that discussion that'll be a great one for greg cosell and adam kaplan i'm jeff mosher thanks everybody you've been watching the intel with Greg Cosell.